Wonderful. So I think uh, the way to make this class really work well, and we are recording this on YouTube, is to understand that um, everything that we do is up on GitHub. GitHub provides me as a teacher of an instantaneous way of correcting any errors that I have in code and putting it online. And so what you'll find if you go to my class is github.com Stefan Bund, that's my name, 311. Hopefully you can commit that to memory and you guys can do a number of things. One, you can see live uh, code. So here's here's the actual code that I'm going to demo today. I can actually link to lines. So that line is available as a hyperlink. So I can be like, you can write me an email and be like, da -da 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 -da, and I can say, hey, use this line or check that line out. Or um, You can even make your own GitHub repo and say, hey, Mr. Bond, I have this one line that's continuing to fail. Here's my bad code. And here's the line where I continuously get errors. No, I mean, I think only a few students has done, have done this. But I think GitHub is some kind of God's gift to uh, programming education. Um, Blackboard is not. Blackboard is for your political science class where, hi, welcome to PolySci 101. Here are some slides that I had in class. And, you know, great. But programming is a, it's harder, it's, it's scarier for people. Um, people are more disoriented by what's happening. And largely it's because um, the way that programming works is that nobody goes to school to learn it that you can't really teach programmers. They're already doing it. It's For them, it's just a, a parade. That's bad because civilization needs to generate more programmers. And if they don't, you know, there will be more poor people. Does that make sense? There, we just simply need more high income, high earner, automation producing people. Does that make sense? Programmers are at the top of that food chain. So this program, this code and everything is kind of my, my wheelhouse. We want you to be, you know, using this. Also, my lectures, I'm going to be going through this line by line, and I'm going to move fast, and it's going to be hard to get your questions answered. So my thoughts are, go ahead and attend class and, you know, bring a pad of paper. Commit a revolutionary act. Bring a pad of paper to class. Be the true contrarian. Does anybody have a pad of paper? That's great. Good job. All the young women have a pad of paper. And one guy. Well, you're, a, you're exceptional for your gender. Your, your penmanship is probably awful. And I... But I think my generation, everybody was trying to write it down... And the reason why is because the teacher was like, here it is. Here's why you're here. And if we didn't write it down, I don't think we could recover that expensive knowledge. At this school, I'm like, it's on YouTube. The, the pressure of acquiring something is quite minimal. Um, but my thoughts are probably you want to acquire about 10% of what was said. You want to acquire a skeleton of what was said, and then allow the YouTube to fill in the blanks later. Be like, you know what, he was talking about that, I totally missed that, I'm gonna go back and slow it down. And then watch the YouTube like four times. You know, and then come back and be like, you know what, you did this move where you were just kinda, I got it and then I did it. And so I think we'll get more done using the, situa using the system. But GitHub is gonna be where we're at. My personal feeling is as you move out of this class into the employment you know, domain, um, your, employ your employers are going to need to either see a, a real live hosted app, you know, something like a website, a URL, or they're going to need to see a GitHub repo, a re this is called a repo, a repository, in order for them to get to know you better. So if you just put your stuff that you make for me in a GitHub, the likelihood of securing a $65,000 job or internship, you know, 30 hour week job, after this class dramatically goes up. So GitHub is kind of where the cool people are, the kind of the people in the know are. Now that being said, a student can go ahead and, you know, we, we've organized these by units. Uh, we can go ahead and go in them and grab 
the file that interests you. You know, for example, we're going to go over a few of these. And you can kind of grab the file that interests you, and you can kind of download it. You can just grab it. If you go to raw, and then you just, that's the code, and then you go S, you know, control S, you'll, sam you'll save that to some location, and then it, it will work to a certain extent. Now, what I love is the student says, hey, Mr. Bund, I downloaded your stuff and I got an error. And I was kind of like, both yourself and my five and a half year old are giving me a hard time today. Because in fact, there may well be 98% correctness in my code, but there may be something out there that is necessary for you to personalize in order for it to work. And I think many of you are going to go on and do a lot of government IT. I had a student last term who got hired at a government agency, and he couldn't even tell me where. They wouldn't allow him to tell anyone where he was last weekend. And I'm like, either you are in Lake Tahoe having a wonderful time with a wonderful alibi, or you are actually Homeland Security. Does that make sense? I think all the wonderful acronyms of the government are looking to hire you here. Um, but, uh, and, and you know, I, I want to say that, um, and I'm kind of forgetting the story of where I was going here, but I think that um, you're going to need to learn a lot of deep security configuration along the way. And I think a lot of you really want to learn that. So I think this is the right version of 3.11 for many of you to take because many of you are very interested in security and doing deep IT. And in many ways, by doing AWS, we're preparing you for CIA material because CIA runs a, an instance of, of AWS. Does that make sense? Very interesting. And we'll show you, you know, we'll show you the, the news press releases about that. Very cool. But a lot of the code here, you should just grab the code and then watch the YouTube and then customize the code and then present me with your errors. I really like errors. And then another cool thing about GitHub is you go into issues, and I know many of you don't like to admit that you have issues, joke, but you go new issue and you present that, then I get a quick email and that you will find that people fix issues on GitHub a lot faster than if you were to just post it on Stack Overflow or any other environment because it's live on the internet. If I don't fix an issue, I look like a mean guy. Does that make sense? Like, I don't care. And so I'm going to want to do the politically correct thing and be like, no, here's me trying to help, virtue signal. Does that make sense? I really will try to help. So I think by you putting a question up on here, that's excellent. That's wonderful. And other people will see your answer and be like, I'm going to do what that smart guy or what that smart girl did. Now, this means that you're going to want to sign up and get your own GitHub account. I have my own GitHub account. You're going to need to get a GitHub account. It also means that your Blackboard is going to be where your grades are and virtually nothing else. Um, I don't do much of Blackboard. I find that when people message me for Blackboard, the message goes unread for a month, and then I finally reply after a month and say, sorry, I did not reply. Like, I should put an autoresponder on my Blackboard that says, sorry, I did not reply, you know, and like have it wait there for it. So don't use Blackboard to communicate with you. Use your Cal Poly email. Um, don't text me. That's not going to work. I have a lot of hilarious, and it's not that I have a problem getting your text. It's just that it's been embarrassing in the past. Does that make sense? Like, I find that people, when they text you, they will text you after 10 p.m. I used to have my, my all my Apple devices in my home kind of on the same account, and then I had a wonderful girl. Her name was Shantae, or she had this spectacular, Deshante, or she had this spectacular name, and I got a text message from this young woman at 10 p.m., and she very much in earnest just wanted to get something finished. And my wife kind of called at me on the, on the other side of the house, like, who is Deshante? <laughs> you know, and I had to have this awkward explanation of who this, you know, this woman on the other side of the text message was. Not that that's a problem, you know, but my preference is um, people, they hide behind text messages, and I, I rarely know who's on the other end. So you're going to get this, who is this? And that kind of, it, that's not professional. Put your questions to me via email. Now, what also I believe is you have your syllabus right here on the GitHub. 
Now, I should have a link to the syllabus through Blackboard, but my Blackboard languishes. The only thing I really do with Blackboard is put in grades. So your syllabus is right here. Now, you can download a copy of this, and I recommend that you do so, or don't. Just know that it's always here to bring up on your phablet, right, on your megaphone. By megaphone, I mean your super large phone, you know, as you see fit. And everything that you need is going to be, you know, right there. Wonderful. Now, instead of going deep into the syllabus, I'm just going to allow you to read it. and You can ask whatever question you see fit. The general gist of the class is um, there's going to be, uh, I think, uh, eight or ten units. And um, there are going to be six distinct lectures that are going to move fast and furious. And then there's going to be time toward the end of class to slow it down. And, and so your four-person work group is going to be your greatest tool in acquiring all of this information in a short period. Does that make sense? So, you know, the first six weeks are going to be pretty fast and furious. Then you're going to be in the business of kind of customizing and making things work. Does that make sense? So I think the way to be a good group member is to kind of be vigilant and be trying to get all the details and then take your problems to your group and then say, hey, did you catch this or... Did you get this, or does that make sense? Coding is very communal um, at this stage. So that's how it'll work. So every week, you will have a team representative give me an email that links to your homework, and I'm going to look it over and give it a grade, and you know we're going to go from there. And most likely, we'll be able to visit and talk on Thursday. So Tuesday, I'm kind of hot to trot, like high adrenaline, trying to get it all taught, and then Thursday, it's going to be slow time where you can ask questions on an individual basis and be more of a lab. It's not officially a lab, but it's going to work like a lab. So I think Thursday is like ground zero. Like you got to be there Thursday because your group is going to be working together hard Thursday. And that's going to be an important leadership moment. Then you may be working throughout the weekend. So now let's, let's do um, – now let's kick this off correctly – I want to talk about what I'm busy with professionally. Um, I'm very busy with the Bitcoin trader community. Um, this is uh, the graph of Bitcoin. That's very important to me. I work on on um, what I'm. I work on analytics. I used to be very busy with algorithms as it pertains to trading. I'm less busy with algorithms, but I'm more interested in analytics as they pertain to financial markets. And largely what I look at is what are called order books. Order books are listings of prices as they've transpired within these marketplaces. And the reason why I focus more on order books and less on having programs execute trades for me is because I'd prefer to trade maybe once or twice a month, but choose the best place inside of that tradable graph to buy. So I don't want to buy and sell the daily chaff which is what high frequency trading does. I want to buy one of these golden moments where everything is on sale, right? I want Prada on sale, but I need to know that this is a bottom. Like, how do I know that this is a bottom? How do I know that this isn't this? And if I buy right here, it's just going to die on me. It happens, right? Bitcoin, the cryptos, it's the wild west. You know, you got to like that. But frankly, if you can grab hold of this down here, you know, and you write it up 20%, get out of it, you're good, and you will go 20% on your investment every 12 days or so. That's about what I, I think a good, a good manager will do. But in order to do that, you need what are called order book analytics that give you a warning when there's large sell-off conditions. This is a great image, and I, I try to get – oh, I'm sorry. I may not get the right image here. You see in this image, this is what's called an order book, where here's everybody – here's all the sell orders. Or rather, here's all the buy orders, my fault. Here's where everybody's willing to buy, and here's where everybody's willing to sell. Now, this is what's called a sell wall, where there's a very large number of orders that want to execute right at the midpoint. This means that this is a huge this 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 is what that 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 huge red candle, that's what this looks like. Right? Where there's this huge accumulation of people wanting to get out of this marketplace, like sell, sell, sell. 
and there's not a lot of people willing to buy this kind of stuff. So there's a little bit of a of a pro so this kind of crash that's a lot of people selling off at one time. That's good because that means that um, you need to be around for that crash and you need to have cash in hand so you can gobble it up. Bitcoin is the future of money. And if you believe that, then you want to be around to buy it. Does that make sense? So I'm less interested. I came into Bitcoin sensing that there was something there. But what I really, what I want to avoid is the kind of algorithms that buy automatically. What I want to do is I want to detect the moments where there's real weakness in price and I can swoop in and get a good bargain. Because guess what? Bargains don't last. Black Friday, you know, those TVs, they go quick. You know, Bitcoin is a TV on Black Friday, is a 4K on Black Friday, on, on Thanksgiving weekend, you know. Um, and what happens is, boom, I get a 20% gain on that. If I do 20% every 12 days, sayonara. I commute via helicopter at that point. <laughs> you might not have thought my class was cool back in the day, but you'll think it's cool then, okay? So my thoughts are, this is, you guys can build order books like this using JavaScript. That's fine. JavaScript is a very mainstream programming language. And we want to get toward this. I don't know if we'll talk a lot about this, but I do want to say that, you know, I'm a working coder. I, I do this outside. Um, and... Um, I, I want to try to bring a little of that profession in, into, the, into the, the walled garden of the university so that you have a sense of the, you know, the relevance of it. All right. So um, the first thing I want to do with you guys is I want to introduce um, Amazon Web Services. And you don't need to do this with me, but you can probably go to the website and kind of bookmark the page and go back to it. I mean, it's going to be on... YouTube. I mean, who cares? You know, it's so fast. Here in AWS, um, it's really the most profitable element within the Amazon story right now. I mean, Amazon is the the leading stock uh, in the the Nasdaq right now. The, the the stock markets are based upon the progress of Amazon. It's the most positive leader at this point. And here at CIS, we talk about hot tech companies every term. And I've seen many hot tech companies come and go. I mean, if it were two or three years ago, we'd be talking about uh, Groupon. You ever heard of Groupon? That was the major, I mean, we talked about Groupon the way that we talk about Amazon right now. Um, frankly, last year, it was all about Ethereum. I, fr I frankly think Ethereum will return as something that you guys want to talk about. Guess what it was last year? It was all about Waze. It was all about Uber. We're not talking about Uber and Waze quite as much. We're talking about Amazon right now. So that's going to change, right? The Vogue will change. But Amazon's a tremendous company. I've, I've spent about the last 10 years mastering their AWS because they do what, I, what I'm most interested in, which is to create infrastructures that I can use to host software, web-based products. That's a big deal to me. If I were to try to rebuild on my own what Amazon gives me in a moment, it would take me so much money and so much expertise, and I would need to be carrying around an AR-15 to secure, you know, a pretty serious. I'd have to carry bullets in order to secure the real estate necessary to deliver computing. That's a big deal. That takes a whole extra person with whole extra expertise to secure a site. I mean, there's a reason why eBay puts their server farms in the middle of the desert is because they can see people coming from miles around. And that's important. F Facebook has to do the same thing. They're actually, there's a physical element to securing your data. And that's beyond just the buying of the bandwidth and the, the procuring of the boxes, right? And the maintenance of electricity. There's very real hard expenses that go on with websites. And that's very cool to think about. We're gonna do a lot of that in this class. But Amazon is a fast way for a programmer to get all those things very fast. So your homework almost immediately is to get yourself your own Amazon account. Now, you guys are better than we ever were. There's this thing called the Amazon free tier. And Amazon really wants for students to grab the AWS free tier. And they want, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if there's an academic version of this, you know, for students, et cetera. 
they really want for you guys to make AWS a part of your, you know, your programming. Um, everybody knows that the next great startup is going to get hatched by some nutty college kid. Does that make sense? Like the Facebook, the Snapchats, you know, you guys are meaningful. You know, like you, you have a lot of um, runway. So grab a hold of that free tier. That means that you get one year of free usage. Now, the usage comes within limits. And basically, it's not enough to really boot up a startup. It's not. It's enough to develop the website for four or five users to test it, but that's meaningful. And that may be just enough for your team to get an A in a class like this. And the free tier is wonderful. Um, I'm no longer eligible for free tier, so you know I'm, I'm not gonna use that. However, I found that in my way of using AWS, if you just do what I ask you to do, you're not gonna have any expenses. If you wander off the reservation and boot up like a MySQL server farm, you know, you may end up with a couple hundred dollars of expenses on your AWS. Something I need to put out there, um, you don't have any books that you're required to buy for this class. You're pretty much free on this class. The software is free. Um, even the Visual Studio is going to end up being free. The Amazon's going to end up being free, but you need to put a debit card or a credit card in your AWS account for them to use it. So. I respect that that may take some negotiation with family members, and that's a negotiation that I'd like you to pursue. Be like, this is a class, I'm not gonna have any expenses. If you get it on you know, grandma's credit card, you know, you're not gonna have any expenses. And all you're gonna need to do is just follow what the instructor does and do the instructor's um, thing, and you won't have any expenses. I spend, with all of the um, stuff that I have on AWS, I have spent as little as 12 cents a month. I have about eight bucks that I need to spend a month because I'm doing a lot of demos with you guys. I can live with that. I will deduct that from my taxes at the end of the year. Uncle Sam will help me out on that. Okay, so I am good. So that breathes a lot of oxygen into your product, your, uh, your projects. So once you have your account, you're going to log in. And I'm not going to walk you through this because you guys are very good at this stuff, very fast. And so this is um, Amazon. Amazon is a full-blown IT company. And the, the Amazon Web Services is not the same computational infrastructure that you guys use to order things on Amazon. It's a wholly separate business that runs computers just for you guys to use. So you're not computing for cycle time with you know, the guy down the street who sells things out of his garage. Quite differently. This is an IT company that's made just for you. And you know, this is a multi-billion dollar business for Amazon. And at this point, the exponential rate of adoption among AWS has reached a point where now they make a couple billion dollars per quarter, if I understand it correctly. I don't think there's a separate balance sheet for AWS. But then again, I'm not an Amazon investor, so I would I'd be glad to be corrected in that regard. The major service that you're going to look in today is called S3. It's called um, I always mess up the name of S3 because I all I do is I just call it it's called static file service or static storage service or something like that. I, but I just call it S3. I for, I haven't had to remember what it's called for about ten years. I think it's called static, but I use it all the time. Now, what you guys are going to be doing is you're going to be making what's called a bucket here. And I'm just going to, you're going to call, let's call this the sample starter bucket uh, spring 18. And oh, I just want to take out those. Now, the bucket must be a unique name, so you may not get your choice. I'm going to choose the Oregon region because it's very low cost. There are other regions. It would be hilarious for our students to release their website in, you know, outside of America. I would love to see it. It's very rare that I have a student who's booting up a server in Mumbai, but give it a shot. It'll work. Give it a shot. It'll happen. You'll be like, hey, mom, I just made a website in Seoul. Sweet. <laughs> Like, make fun of North Korea. That would be wonderful. I'd be like, you get a high five. You just, you're fighting the North Koreans in South Korea. Like, you're amazing. 
take that down. <laughs> you know, like don't get us in trouble. But you can boot up a server wherever you see fit. Um, America, North Virginia is very cheap. That's the original Amazon S3. Ohio is very cheap. Northern California is three times the cost. Oregon is also very cheap. You need to actually pay attention to which region you're releasing on. So you just need to know that it, you can't forget about it. And, and then you're going to go next. Um, I want you to kind of next your way through a lot of this. And then because it's going to become a website very soon, you can, re you can grant what's called public read uh, access. That means that other people can see what's in the bucket, which means that's kind of like a website. Okay, so we'll create that bucket. Error setting properties and permissions. Okay, that's fine. Why don't we see if it, if it built? Sample starter bucket. Okay, that's great. Now, if I go on into this bucket, um, I want to set up permissions in this one. And I can set up the properties in this one. And I want you guys to go over to static website hosting, use this bucket to host the website. We'll put in an index.html here. That's the default document that shows up when you go to the URL. And just in case people do not find a particular file there, they will see an error document. And so we will configure an error document there. And you can always turn it off by disable website hosting. Now that means that it's now a public website. And if I go over my overview and I go over my S3 sample starter, uh, and you'll see here, do, it's not public, okay. I'll set a read. We'll have public access. And let's be able to list objects, that's fine. And there's a, a lot of, we're going to be setting this course configuration in a minute as well. That's public, that's promising. So when I select that, that there should be a URL that, that's showing up there. So I may need to fix that if I'm having any errors. You know, I'm on YouTube, I gotta fix my errors. Static website hosting should be up, permissions. Uh, it is public, everyone should be able to see it. Let's just look at that one more time. Um, this is kind of what I was looking for. Where this, see this 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 link right here. If I open this up, it's not quite public yet. So I may just fix that and bring you to it in a minute. Maybe I can disable it. And then let's see how we're doing. Now, what I want to do is I want to be able to upload a file from my system. And this will go back to our GitHub. So I'm going to fill in this in a minute. But this is our unit one files. And we have a few files related to introductory JavaScript. So what I will leave you with in this first video is I'm going to upload this first file. And maybe it will become clear to me why it's having a problem. But I will create, create a read access on that object. Let's go next. Set the properties to grantees. Do not grant public read on this object. Grant public read on the object, great. Sometimes the UI changes a little bit. And then that should go live. Now I have a file there. What's cool is that that file has a public URL as well. So it looks like we publicized it correctly because now we have a little tiny page with a little tiny bit of content on it. 
And that gives us a beginning point, and you see what I'm doing with my browser, is I'm right-clicking, I'm going to inspect, not view page source, I want to inspect it. Inspect is a totally different tool. You're going to use inspect throughout your time here to look at the code inside of this page. And this is the way that you guys can hack websites nicely by looking at the content. And what I've done here is I've set up my HTML. It's running HTML5. I don't know what that script is about. We're going to deep, but we're going to take a look at that. Oh, this has to do with MetaMask, which is a um, I use that for uh, Ethereum development. That's this right here. And we won't talk about MetaMask. <laughs> it's ugly. That's the head of the page. The head of the page is where I create the equivalent of pre-compiler directives. So a Java file, you would have some import statements at the top that you're accustomed to. The head is where I link to other resources on the web that the page will need. Right now, this basic example doesn't need any other uh, assets anywhere else. The body is everything that is visible within the page. So everything that the user can see, that falls within the body. So the body is the user experience. And these are some comments. You notice that these don't show up. These are not visible, but the comments are there to talk to other programmers, right? Or maybe just to leave some notes for yourself. What I've done here is I've created a paragraph. And what I like so much about inspect element is that when I go select an element right there, I can actually select something on the page and it will reveal the HTML necessary to code that element. So you can see right here now that this paragraph is linked to that little bit of content that's showing up. Now you can see that paragraph is a P tag, it has the little, um, the, the caret at the front and a paragraph. There's an ID which is associated with it. I'm going over this fast, but this is the things that you need to know, and this first week is when you get to know this stuff, right? So just, this is what you need to know. The ID is a word that I code on my own, and that's what makes JavaScript able to see that element later. So JavaScript can control what shows up on the page. The JavaScript can add any element, any amount of artificial intelligence to a page. And so, that ID is how I will control that element later. And then I add, then I, I finish the tag just like this. Now, there's hundreds of different uh, HTML tags that you guys will experience, but they all work in that way, where you have a, an opening tag and you have a closing tag, and then you have a little bit of content that shows up there. Now, what's kind of cool about this content is I can write John Doe, you know, type it in, or I can have JavaScript put it in there for me which is kind of a big deal for me because it means that I can write software on a page that customizes the user experience related to how much I know about that person. So I can make that page way more humane than I would if I wasn't using the JavaScript. And that's what I want to get, get, get through in my first week. Now, it just so happens here that I start a script. So when I put on a script, it means that I'm going to embed some JavaScript in the page. It's like, Here's a web page, and the script puts a little software in the page. That means that the browser is responsible for rendering or compiling, in this case, interpreting that script. So the browser is really an, is more like a compiler when you think about it. Now, the people who made the browsers, they're like, well, it's not a compiler. It doesn't do some of the things that compilers do. So you call it an interpreter, if you wish. A interpreter is a very low-weight compiler, a very simple Compile it works very fast. And therefore, it makes JavaScript a dynamically interpreted language versus Java, which is a compiled language. That difference is just for the geeks in the room who want to discuss that, you know, the researchers. But it does mean that your browser is a compiler. And it, what it does is JavaScript is the source code of the internet, and it is being made freshly whenever that page loads, which you know, it has some interesting implications for your website. So when we put script, that says to the browser, hey browser, begin to run this code through your onboard compiler. And here's the code. Variable of type person. This is something I'm going to define right here. Um, JavaScript is not like um, Java, where Java you say, hey, this is going to be a number. Or hey, this is going to be a word. Or hey, this is going to be a floating point number. 
There are no uh, data types in um, JavaScript the way that they are in Java. JavaScript will actually allow you to just give it some data and it will guess what type of data that is, hence increasing the speed of its compilation and its more efficient memory use. But what I get to do here is I will define an object through the use of this, um, this bracket. And I'll say, well, this object has a first name, last name, age, and eye color set of attributes. And I will define what those are right here. And this is called a prototype. And I'll finish that with a with the semicolon. And then what I'll say is, hey, within the document, get all the elements that are called demo. That's what get element by ID does. It says, hi, grab the stuff that's called demo. And then set the HTML of that to be whatever the first name of the person is, plus concatenate the space, plus the last name of that person. And that's where John Doe comes from. So even though it says John Doe right here, I didn't type it. JavaScript figured out what to show the user. JavaScript made a little bit of a decision as to what the user is going to see. JavaScript is helping me do some of the thinking. So in your first week, you guys are writing smart websites, websites that can make decisions on behalf of the user. That to me, that's software engineering, right? It's computer media that has some human value, right? It has some cultural value. So that's an important um, example. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to cap this video. You've been good students, and we'll start up in a couple minutes.